Well, hello, church. My name is Kevin Guido, and I am the global strategist and online pastor for Fresh Life. And I love this church. I love Pastor Levi and Jenny and their family. They are straight up gifts to our church. And, and I love you, the people that make this amazing group, people all over the world who are linked up together in a moment like this on phones and on tablets and at watch parties. I mean, what an amazing thing to be a part of. Today, I get the honor of jumping into God's Word with you, coming from a place that hopefully feels uh, a little bit like the space that you could be joining us from right now. Well, my wife Elena and I, along with our two kiddos, were building the church in Jackson Hole. And I don't know if you've ever been out here before, but I swear Jackson Hole is one of the most beautiful places in all of the world. People here would probably be like, like, no, 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 shh, 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 shh. Don't, don't just don't say that. Don't say that. But here's the deal. I mean, these these snow-capped Tetons, they are a sight to behold. And last year, our ski mountain received uh, a total of 440 inches of snow, which I would consider pretty crazy, aside from the fact that the this year's forecast is calling for 30% more snow just because of La Nina. Now, don't get me wrong. Surfing across that fresh pow on those double-digit days is one of the greatest feelings ever. But like most things in life, there's a price that you pay for those lines, and that would be driving. When we first moved to Jackson, our family had found a place about 11 miles south of town, and at the time I was driving this glorious black F-150 that I called the fake Raptor, had a leveling kit, 35-inch BF Goodrich all-terrain tires, the grill with the three amber lights, and the daytime running LED headlamps, and one of my favorite things to do on this winding stretch of snow-covered pavement was to rescue anybody whose vehicle with lesser cold weather capabilities would get stuck. So I kept a toe strap in the back, and, and I kid you not, there were days where on my way home from work, I would pull at least four vehicles out of the snow. Now, I took a great sense of pride in the fact that I was the self-designated neighborhood hero. Until one day, my son, Zachary, and I had decided to, to head up to the mountain to do some skiing and snowboarding. And we packed up our gear the night before, and, and we were ready to rock and roll that next morning. We got up early, and we, we loaded up, we set off, and while we were driving down the road, something fell onto my seat, and I, I reached down to pick it up, when all of a sudden I, I felt this drag on the truck from the passenger side. And when I looked up, it was too late. I had allowed my, my passenger side tires to gently kiss the snowbank on the side of the road, which immediately transformed this situation into a black hole that sucked my vehicle into an abyss of snow and devastation. The bank of the road had a bit of a drop to it, and it welcomed my truck to rest like a, like a soft down comforter. We were stuck. We, we, we weren't just stuck. We were real stuck. My tires are spinning, but we were going absolutely nowhere. Now, for all of you who are watching from anywhere south of the equator, Australia, whatever, you're going to have to use your imagination because as we slip into winter here in the Rockies, you're pulling out board shorts and heading to the beach. So maybe think of sand instead of snow, and, and all of this illustration will just work out a little bit better. But, but here we have the self-designated hero getting stuck and needing help. It's, it's quite the humbling experience when you feel helpless. It's kind of the worst feeling. Like There's literally nothing that you can do except wait for somebody to come to your rescue. You ever felt like that? Just stuck? Like you weren't moving forward? Like your tires were spinning because you're pushing the gas, but you're just not moving anywhere. I think if we're honest, we would all agree that we've been there, right? We've, we've experienced that, that feeling of just helplessness. Heck, I think even as the church, we can feel stuck sometimes, especially in a season like this, we're dealing with issues in community that we have never experienced before. COVID has done thrown a wrench into everything normal we've ever known or come to expect as the church. How can you, how can you build a community when, when getting together in a community and, and gatherings is just so difficult? 
we think to ourselves, when, when, will, when will things go back to normal? Right? When, when can it go back to how things used to be? But the question, the question that I want to answer in a season like this is not when we're going back, but how are we going to move forward? How can we be a moving church? If you're taking notes, that's the title of this message, okay? Moving church. What does it mean to be the church in motion, right? Because that's the goal when, when we feel stuck. How do we get moving again? And I think there's some lessons that, that we can learn from the church when it was just getting started about how to move forward. In Acts, in, in, in chapter 9, verse 31, we get to see the church, a, a moving church. And, and this is what it says. It says, so the church throughout all of Judea and Galilee and Samaria, it had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. I think in this passage, there are three distinct ways that we as a church can start moving. But, but before we dive in, let's, let's just let's pray together. God, I just... I thank you so much for this opportunity for us as the church to, to come together in this moment. And uh, I pray that as we crack open your word and as we're huddled together and either around our devices or in homes or in wherever we're at, God, I just pray that, that you would speak something powerful and something special into our hearts. And I pray that you would encourage us, God, in ways that maybe we feel stuck. God, I pray that you would show us how we can move forward. And um, God, I just, I pray that you would take this time and you would use it in a special way. And we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so for us as the church to begin moving, the first thing that we need to do is move from paralysis to peace. This is the first thing that I noticed in this passage. It's, it's something that the church had. What was it? It was peace. It was something that, that they had attained, something that they could, they could touch, something that they could feel, something that defined who they were and, and, and how, what they did and how they did it, right? But, but what is this peace and, and how, can, how in the world can you get it? I don't know what it's like in your house, but an interesting occurrence takes place in our house the moment that uh, we get done eating dinner. First off, the Guidos eat dinner at like 8.30, so you're going to have to adjust this image to your own personal experience. But as soon as we get done eating dinner, my wife tells our kids that they need to get ready for bed. It's at that moment that this dramatic shift takes place. And I don't know, I don't know if it's because my children are now fueled with plenty of energy from a hearty meal that they just recently consumed, but our home, our house, it transitions into a battlefield of total and complete chaos it becomes absolute madness. And after getting ready for bed, the kids, they make their way back into the kitchen. My daughter's leaping back and forth like a jackrabbit across the room, egging on our dog and trying to rile her up in such a way that, that she would be prepared to run a race against greyhounds or, or take down a grizzly in the wild. And my dog responding to the goading by leaping and darting back and forth across the house and and my son now in the room riding a, a ripstick in circles around the kitchen island telling us it, it's stories of adventures of the world of pop culture and gaming and my wife boiling a, a, a pot of water in a kettle on the stove. It's now hissing with that shrill high-pitched whistling as if the Santa Fe Express was making its way through our kitchen. But I just sit there in my chair taking it all in total and complete madness then then something magical happens my wife equips each of our children with a a sleepy time tea concoction that she probably manifested using trees and branches and herbs from our house's landscape and and sends them off to bed at which point a, a sort of calm begins to fall upon our home Chaos becomes still. Madness becomes quiet. And peace overtakes our home. A remarkable stillness. But sometimes that's just not how we feel. 
Instead, it feels like anything and everything is screaming at you all at once. Like, like everything is demanding all of you all at the same time. And it's the opposite of remarkably still. Instead, it feels overwhelming. It, it feels paralyzing. And like you can't do it all. And so you do nothing at all. And in this passage, when the Bible speaks about the church having peace, it specifically is talking about this sense of tranquility, a state of their soul. But their world wasn't necessarily peaceful. You see, Paul, who used to uh, arrest and kill Christians, he encountered Jesus in such a way that it, it changed his life forever. And now instead of trying to destroy the church, he starts building it up. But for obvious reasons, the church doesn't trust him. They thought that, uh, that he was still out to get them until this dude named Barnabas, he vouched for him and he backed him up. You know what? It's a good thing to have a Barnabas in your corner. Somebody who believes in you even when the whole entire world around you doesn't. Somebody who will, who will be standing there beside you on your, on your best days and, and, and they're holding you up on your worst days. Do you, do you have somebody like that? Or, or even a group of people like that? The church was never intended to be a, a solo thing. It was, it was never supposed to be on your own, but in a community with people. But sometimes you, you've got to invite that community into your life. If you, if you don't have that, then think about stepping into a Fresh Life group. Joining a group is a super easy way for you to get to know the people who who would be there for you like that, or that you could be there for. Barnabas standing up for Paul is just a beautiful picture of the church in action. It's the church moving. And so Paul was, was, be, was being welcomed into the church, slowly but surely. But while, he, while this was happening, a, a radical group of Jews had been, who'd been indoctrinated by this whole Greek culture called Hellenists, they were trying to murder Paul. So the church sent Paul back to, to where he was from, right? Tarsus. Not exactly what I would consider to be a peaceful time. And yet, they had peace. I know for me, life feels like anything but tranquil. When I think of tranquility, I think of like a Zen garden in Japan with, uh, you know, a little koi fish in a pond and oddly shaped trees and cherry blossom buds periodically circling through the area. My life, my life, however, it feels a bit more like an, like an ACDC concert happening in the backseat of our forerunner, right? There's fire and am jumping, face paint, thunder, right? It's, it's one thing to experience peace and the calm, right? The kids go to bed, ah, peace, quiet, calm. It's quite a different thing to experience peace in the midst of a storm. A few years back, I, uh, I was going through a really, really hard time and I'd experienced a serious amount of regret, and sadness, my heart was just a total mess. And I, I couldn't do my job, I couldn't sleep, I couldn't think because this difficulty was just all consuming. And one night I was just laying there unable to sleep when a friend of mine had reached out to me and, and he encouraged me to do something that that I would not normally have done in a moment like this, mostly because I'm just stubborn, extremely stubborn. But my friend suggested that I listen to a song and, and just let the, the lyrics encourage my heart. And so I did. And these were the lyrics that were being sung into this moment. I said, I know that you are here now. Still my heart. and Let your voice be all I hear now. Fix my eyes on the things that I can't see now. Spirit, breathe like the wind. Come and have your way. Those words began to, to fall onto me, to, to fall on my heart. And while I was hearing these truths repeated over and over, something, something started to happen inside of me. A heart that was stone cold, frozen, frustrated, and overwhelmed began to melt. And where there was sadness, hope started taking root. Where there was disappointment, perspective took over. And truth covered over my frustration. Nothing, nothing really changed regarding my situation. Everything was still exactly the same. And yet, it was all different. 
before I was paralyzed, unable to move, unable to think, unable to go. But the simple act of listening to that song it, it, it acknowledged the fact that no matter where I am or what I've done or where I'm going, God is, is there with me, fighting for me. And it filled my heart with peace and enabled me to move forward. It was such a simple thing to do, and yet it made all the difference in the world. You can't move from paralysis until you step into peace. Stepping into peace implies action on your part. You have to consciously take a step. What's paralyzed you? Our world has been marked by anxiety, overwhelming and crippling anxiety, right? We're constantly being distracted by our phones and annoyed by the current state of affairs in our country and, and around the world, obsessed by what everybody else is doing and it's crippling. And in so many ways, we've forgotten the art of meditation. Meditation. It doesn't sound very Christian-like, to which I would disagree wholeheartedly. I mean, look at, look at what God told Joshua about his word. In Joshua 1, he said this. He said, keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Don't be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Joshua, he's, he's getting ready to engage in the fight of his life. But what did God tell him to do? Sharpen the weapons? Train the men? Gather the supplies? Right? Nope. He told him, keep this word in your mind. Ponder on it. Meditate on it. Day and night. To meditate means to, to think about something deeply. It means that you have to stop, stop the noise, stop the thoughts, stop the feeds, stop the shows, stop everything, and, and let the Word of God do a work in your heart. Let the Word of God inject peace into your soul. It's actually something that, that God tells us to do, a command. In Psalm 46, 10, he says, be still and know that I am God. Just stop, breathe in. You are God. You are God. You're with me. The world may be against me, but you are with me. You are here now, guiding me, leading me, loving me, never leaving me. The result? Peace. Peace in the midst of chaos. Peace as the early church experienced it. But what changed? My focus. Let me ask you something. What are you staring at? Stare at the problems and you'll be paralyzed. Stare into the promises of God and you'll have peace. When you have peace, you have the freedom to move. Move where? Move forward. When peace overcomes paralysis, the church then is able to move. So not only did the church move from paralysis to peace, but it moved from sitting to standing. What do you mean? Well, let's look at that verse again. It says that the church had peace and was being built up. The church was being built up. Now, here's what's interesting. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't just say that the church was, was being built up. It says that the church throughout all of Judea and Galilee and Samaria was being built up. Now, when we think of church, we have a tendency to to think about a building, right? But if that were the case, then this would be one of the biggest buildings in the entire world, right? It was a building that would have stretched, that would have covered Judea and Galilee and Samaria. The thing is, it is referring to a building, only a different kind than you would think. Look at what 1 Corinthians 3.16 says. It says, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? When we think of church, we, we so easily associate it with a building built from brick and mortar. But here's the deal. Buildings don't move. You catch that? Buildings don't move, but the church does. 
A building sits on a foundation of concrete and it's affixed to the earth and it doesn't move. But the church is different. The church is moving. What the Bible is saying is that you are now the building. It it used to be about an establishment, but now you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's not not a physical building, but a spiritual temple. And you, the church, the people of God, you are that building and God has made you into his home and it's being built up. You guys, this is not a stalled construction project, but this is a work in motion and God has made you and me. He's made us into his holy temple and he is building it, the church. He's using you to do it. And I love what Jesus said in Matthew 16, 24. He said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. In other words, stand up. It's time to get off your butt and and get to work. It's time to to grab a hammer and stand up and get ready to build. When you're standing, you're ready. Ready for what? Ready to build the church. What's the opposite of, of building up? It's tearing down. And remember, we're not talking about a physical building, but a people. If we're going to be a moving church, then we have to be ready to build up. There's an incredible power in your words. If you didn't realize that, then I would encourage you to to go back a few weeks and listen to part three of the Call of the Wild series called The Muscle That Can Move Mountains. Your words, they have power. Okay, so there's this trend that's been gaining momentum lately. I distinctly remember Tim Tebow talking about it when he spoke here at Fresh Life. And to be honest, it, it sounded like the worst thing in the world to me. And what would that be? The cold plunge. Now imagine a tub filled with water that's ice cold. Like literally, there's ice floating in it. And the idea is that you get inside of the tub. Now I grew up in El Paso, Texas, where we experienced 50 days straight of over 100 degrees. And I loved every bit of it. And because of that, I am an absolute wuss when it comes to anything cold especially cold water. I just, I can't do it. I'm, I'm the person that spends the greater part of 30 minutes just slowly descending into a moderately cool body of water. And that's if it even happens. I'm totally fine just watching from the sidelines as everybody enjoys their cold water festivities. So the idea of willingly getting into a tub of freezing cold water sounds like the stuff of my worst nightmares. And then one day our family was hanging out with some friends and in a hot tub, my happy place, right? But in our proximity was a cold plunge. Oh, Jesus, help me, right? And our friend, who is an expert cold plunger, gets the party started. Three minutes in the tank and then back in the hot tub. And, and even though he made it look super easy, I think to myself, there's no way I'm getting into that thing. Like, I literally cannot do that. God did not design my skin to be able to endure such devastation. But then my 13-year-old son stands up And he jumps in and everybody's cheering him on, right? Counting down the minutes to that elusive three minute mark, 30 seconds left. And then boom, done. He did it. My son pulled it off. And then my wife, she stands up and she hops in the tank. Now you can tell she's actually feeling it. She's writhing in agony in the terrorizing cold water. And and we're all counting down the minutes and encouraging her onward and until she hits the three minutes and, and, and she jumps out of the tank. And, and granted, I was a little worried that she was going to pass out, but eventually she hops back into the tub and homeostasis is found. And, and the inevitable happens, right? Everybody starts encouraging me to do it, setting me up for success by warning me of the initial shocking breath when you first step in, in that, that uncontrollable, <gasps> Right? And, and how the first minute is the most brutal. Meanwhile, I, I'm thinking to myself, like, this is literally my worst nightmare. Like, Kevin likes hot. Kevin does not like cold. But the encouragement continued to build until I eventually stood up. And I moved to the tank. And I dropped in. And then I immediately regretted every decision I had made leading up to that point. But then I heard the encouragement continue. It kept going. You got this. You're killing it. And I stayed in and I kept going well beyond what I felt like I would be capable of, right? My goal was one minute. If I made it to one minute, then I I would have won. One minute turned into three minutes. Three minutes turned into five minutes, at which point my body began to to spasm. And, And it started in my lower back and then it crept up into my neck and this uncontrollable convulsions, like like waking up in the middle of the night and and your calf muscles seizing up, right? 
And, and yet the co- encouragement continued until five minutes turned into seven minutes, at which point I was more than excited to, to move from the cold plunge to the hot tub. And I never thought I would be able to ever do anything like that. Never in my life. But what's amazing is how the encouragement of some friends and some family drew out something from me. I was able to conquer a fear that I felt like I would be impossible to overcome. I mean, my whole life I've thought I could never be a Navy SEAL because I, I just can't do cold water. But you know what was my first thought when I got out of that tub? Shoot, I could be a Navy SEAL. I mean, I was, I was built up. And what, what's amazing is that the church is a building that's building itself. What an unusual and beautiful thing God has created. And think about it. We, as this family, we show into the building that we are all a part of and we build each other up. But you can't, you can't build the church unless you're ready. You can't be sitting on the sidelines. You, you have to be standing. You got to be ready for God to give you the opportunity to build. And then when the time comes, you act on it. Like literally, as I was writing this message, I got a text message from a friend at 1030 at night encouraging me in the writing of this message and saying that God is using me as his vessel to, to communicate his word. And, and all I need to do is just surrender to what and how he'll use me. You know what that is? That's a friend who is standing, a friend with his hammer in his hand, ready and willing to be put to work so that when the spirit moves he, in his heart, he can shoot out a text at 1030 and he responds and he builds the church. And how amazing is it that, that as he sent a text that built me up, it, it builds you up as well. It's the church, it's people ready to build. When the church gets into its hyper stance position and standing up, not sitting down, it becomes ready to move. When we have peace, we're able to move, but when we stand up, we become ready to move. At that point, the church can move from waiting to walking. Acts 9 continues, walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. The church was walking forward, but in fear. Now, I'm not going to lie. Sometimes movement can be a very scary thing to embrace, I broke my wrist snowboarding and it was such a bad break that my doctors were not able to put a cast on it. Apparently the ball on the end of my radius had broken off and then that ball had broken in half and then one of those halves had broken in half. And if they were to cast it, the inflammation inflammation would have would have caused more damage. So instead they they had to install what's called an external fixator. An external fixator is a series of titanium rods and clamps that are screwed into your bones but they remain on the outside of your body. It was just gnarly experience. But six months later, it's all removed, and I'm I'm excited to be able to begin my recovery. I remember thinking how pumped I was to to be able to move my wrist again. But that's not what happened. You see, all the muscles and and the tendons and the skin, they'd all fused together at the points where the screws had gone into my arm and, and into my hand, and the result made my wrist as as stiff as a board. The only thing is, I needed to move my wrist. But after injuring it so bad and it not moving, it was I was terrified to force it to move for fear of breaking it again. Well, as you can tell, my wrist now works perfectly fine today, but that didn't come easy. It required boldness and determination and faith in what the doctors told me I could do to break through what had caused my wrist to be stuck. Let me ask you a question. What are you afraid of? What's holding you back? What limitations have, have you placed on yourself that's, that's keeping you from speaking up at school or at work or in your friend's life? What's keeping you from letting go of that bitterness? What's holding you back from, from writing that check? Who are you afraid to invite to a watch party or a group or or into your home, what, it, what exactly is keeping you from moving forward? You know, I, I wonder if we as the church haven't experienced the, the breakthrough that God has for us because our fear is misplaced. You see, the church was walking forward in fear, but they were not afraid. They weren't afraid, rather they were in awe. And I love how the message translates this passage. It, It says that the church was 
permeated with a deep sense of reverence for God. Permeate, to pass through every part of, to penetrate even through the pores and to be diffused throughout, right? It's a deep sense of reverence that was intricately woven throughout the fabric of the church. They were not paralyzed by fear of God. Rather, they were empowered by a reverence of God. When they realized who who God is and what he was doing, they were filled with boldness to live for him. They had nothing to be afraid of because of who they were with. A while back, I was invited to, to tour the Apple headquarters. And our guide was one of the principal developers in the creation of Siri. And we got to see just about everything, uh, even things that we were not supposed to see. But it, it wasn't because I was anything special. We were able to move freely about Apple's HQ because of who we were with. We could move with confidence through this campus because we were with Siri's father, right? <laughs> who, who I was with, it gave me the confidence to move. The church was able to move forward with a distinct confidence because God was with them. The God who, who, who told Job, where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? And where were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang and, and all of the angels shouted for joy? Who shut up this, the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and, and wrapped in thick darkness, when I, when I fixed limits for it and, and set its doors and its bars in place, when I said, this far you may come, but no further, here is where your proud waves halt. The church feared God and they were pierced to the core of their being with awe. And because of that, they didn't need to be afraid of anything. Instead, they found power, they found boldness, they found supernatural strength to be the church. So I'll ask the question again, what are you afraid of? Stop waiting and start walking. If God is for you, nothing can stand against you. The church walked, the church walked in fear, but it was afraid of nothing. And that doesn't mean it was easy. You see, movement can also be hard. Once I, once I got over the fear of of breaking my wrist by moving it, I became overwhelmed by the sheer difficulty of getting it to move. It was stuck for six months and, and getting it to move again was hard. Being a church that moves is, is not easy. There's been more than one instance that I've thought to myself, I can't do this. It's just too hard. I've got nothing left. I don't know where to go. I don't know how to do this. It's just, it hurts too much to keep going. But look at what Jesus said. He said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded, right? It's the church in motion. That's what that is. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Of course, it's hard. If it were easy, then God wouldn't need to support us always to the very end of the time. But that's the promise that he gave us. Our God will never leave us. He'll never, he'll never abandon us. Rather, our God fights for us and he strengthens us as we move forward with him. The Holy Spirit comforts us when, when we pray in the hard, for help in the hard times. He, he, he comforts us through his word when we don't know what to do. He, he comforts us through the, the people who are standing ready to build up. When you have peace, you're able to move. When you're standing, you're ready to move. When your confidence and strength are in God, you can start moving. Church, listen, this is your time. Are you moving? If not, then why? Are you paralyzed by the world around you? Well, peace is the key. Are you you sitting down? Well, stand up and and get ready to build with any moment that God gives you. Are you you waiting to move? Start walking in the confidence and the strength that, that come from who God is and, and what he's doing through you. Do you know what God can do with a, with a moving church? He can start a movement, a movement that will impact the world that surrounds you, a movement that will help people who are stranded in sin find life and liberty in Jesus. You want that peace in the midst of chaos? You want to build a life on something that's lasting 
You want confidence that goes beyond even your own ability? You, you need encouragement to keep pressing on even when you've got nothing left. Well, it starts with Jesus. And if that's what you want, all you have to do is pray for it. And I would love to lead you in that right now. Let's pray together. If that's you and you're at this this point where you're you're ready, you're just ready to let go and, and to trust your life in God's hands, then it's as simple as praying a prayer. So just pray this after me. Say, Dear Jesus, thank you for dying for me. And thank you for rising to life. I pray that you would come into my heart. I pray that you would fill me with your power. Give me your peace. Give me your strength so that I can live for you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.